that slap in that face was that kick in the ass that I needed. Because the way my stomach would twist when I thought about that, the way I would make a guttural sound mm. because of the fucking regret that I had, that I didn't do something about that, yeah. was my power to stand up for myself going forward. Hi, how are you? Good. I like your message and the delivery of that message. And I just think, I wish I'd met you many years ago because there was nobody like you around. And I just felt really inspired and wanted, I just wanted to talk to you. <laughs> yes. That's really what it was. Let's do this. So how long ago did you come across me? I would say probably about two or three months ago, maybe. Not okay. that long ago. Yeah. And where were you in your relationship journey when you found me? Well, single. You having been through much trauma and turmoil. Yeah, so I'm single, not really looking either at the moment, but Okay. And you'd been single for how long when you came across? I've been fully, like, correctly single. I'd say for six years. I think okay. This is my sixth year of singleness. I have seen people in between that, but as in proper relationship-wise, it's been six years, yeah. Seen people, had some fun here and there too, so some explorations, some tryouts. <laughs> Didn't quite make it through the tryouts kind of thing, <laughs> right? And what was it about what I said that kind of pulled you in? I tell you the thing that's really your conversations with Holly. They're the things that have really recently been making me feel compelled. Obviously, because Holly's story combined with your message, um, and some of the things you've said have kind of made me realise how taken advantage I've been, and how sort of I have known nothing like the way I used to approach dating and relationship I didn't know anything I was like this little bird of prey not prey the, the one that's preyed upon <laughs> not the prey. and just letting all manner of quite horrible things happen to me you know not knowing any different and the way you are guiding Holly through her dating experience and stuff I was just like wow you have a very cut throat way <laughs> you know cutting through the shit which I love and you just making people's eyes open. Yeah. And it's, wow, where were you when I was young, you know? I hear that so much. Oh. I wish I knew you five years ago. I wish I knew you 10 years ago. You would have saved me so much pain. Yeah. And this is why I'm, I'm at this as much as I can possibly get myself out there as an introverted person doing extroverted things. Yeah. I'm designed to do this. I'm compelled to do this. And so I surrender to it and I do the work, but I see why I'm here. I see why I've had the history that I had, which is raised by an abusive mom, leading mm -hmm. me to pick abusive people, low self-esteem, having me with people who were cheaters. And I understand that the purpose of me being here is to educate. I went through all that pain to create a superpower to say, I get it. I get it. Eyes wide open. I get why we make the mistakes. I get what we need to do to fix the mistakes. And I wrote Dating 101 for teens because the sooner we can get that education in, right? Look at us having made all these mistakes saying, I didn't know better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that team book, I love that because I was born, I was quite an early starter before I sort of started seeing guys when I was like 13, 14. Yes. And yeah. literally from then, they were unavailable. So I would find myself kind of being used and then spending years sometimes like pining after this guy who seemed like he really liked me, but the actions were different, but I didn't have the knowledge to know that I don't need to put up with that, right? So I've kind of spent my whole life waiting to be loved by the wrong people yes wow. so. yes by the wrong people because mm. we seek what's familiar even if it's wrong for us yes and and I mean there's so many there's so many instincts that we have that's coded into us wired into us human beings because we're designed for survival seeking the familiar is a survival design if I'm familiar with my territory I know where the predators are I know where the food is I know where the water is I survive 
If I'm unfamiliar, fear of the unknown, right? Haven't we said that? Fear of the unknown? Because unknown territories has unknown dangers. And so even if the unknown territory is actually better than anything we've been in, like when I went from fighting with my husband to not fighting with my husband, yeah. that's un that peace, that level of peace that I created because I took responsibility for my thoughts, emotions, and behaviors was unfamiliar. And it created a whole new level of distress that I had to go through in order to be able to choose peace instead of yeah. sabotaging peace because it's unfamiliar. Yeah. Another one is strength in numbers. An instinct, strength in numbers. So when we see people pull away, even if it's somebody distracted to us, we're like, oh, no, come back. Yes. I need you because there's strength yeah. in numbers. And we have to be aware of our instincts versus functionality. So I have this instinct, but is it functional right now? Should I, mm. should I be pulling this person back? Should I be upset that this is better than anything I've ever had before? And then thinking about our thoughts and emotions and addressing it and really grounding ourselves in reality. And this is an education we need to have because if we are not educated, we are pulled in directions that we should not be going in. Yeah, this is what I like. It's very no nonsense the way you say it. I'm always flabbergasted when I see your lives and there's people arguing or comments, people are arguing with you. I'm like, I don't understand how someone can hear what you're saying and have a problem with it. I don't get it. <laughs> But we know who does though, right? Because there's categories of people. And wouldn't it be nice if it was one category? Everybody's amazing. Everybody's <laughs> respectful, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody is here to be of service, not just be takers, but be contributors. Wouldn't that be amazing? Mm -hmm. But we don't. We have levels of people. We mm -hmm. have the people who simply are amazing. We have the people who are in between who can decide to be amazing or not. And we have the people who are deciding not to be. And the people who are deciding not to be are the ones fighting in my comment section, trying to make me look bad. Mm. So hard to make me look bad, <laughs> right? You're because never succeeding because you're always just like, nope. <laughs> no, I love that about you. You're, I'm inspired a lot by your confidence, actually. Were, yeah. you, were you always that confident? No. Tell me a bit about that. I'd love just a bit about your confidence journey. Yeah. Well, so... There's nature versus nurture, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I always had it in mm -hmm. me to be this confident. And there were certain things that my mom did right to feed into that confidence. One of those things was she always said to me, you can do anything you want. And my mom's a smart cookie. My mom is an intelligent woman. She is dysfunctional and she has yet to fix that dysfunction but she is a very intelligent woman. She's a very observant woman. I see her. I got that from her because I walk into any space and I'm like, wow, I see so much. And mm -hmm. I see my mom looking at things, noting. So my mom noted my intelligence. And she would say to me, you can do anything. And as a child, I thought it was one of those things that moms say. But then as an mm -hmm. adult, my mom pointed some things out. She said, I did shitty in school because I was bored in school and mm. they would pull me aside before it was time to grade stuff. And they'd say, you're failing, but if you pass this next test, if you hand in this next project, get a good grade, it's going to pull you enough to pass. And so they would, I get the pull asides all the time and I would do what they would tell me to do to pass. But otherwise I was just skimming, but my mom noticed that I could skim and then give that little bit of effort and then pass and keep going. And so that's why she was saying, because she saw that capability in me, she pointed it out to me and she was so forceful that you could do anything you want. So that was a good thing that she did, but then she was also abusive. So it was difficult to be myself because being myself wasn't accepted in my house mm. by my mom. And so I was very often secluded because my mom would ground me and grounding was no TV, no going out, no phone calls. And so I spent a lot of time, a lot of time in isolation. And that can reduce your ability to understand how to navigate this world in a healthy, functional way and be able to stand up for yourself when shit happens. So there was like a balance that went on. And I had to learn to stand up for myself because my abusive mom saying, don't look at me that way. I'll slap you in the face. Right. And so I go out into the world and I'm being abused by other people. And I had to learn to say no to that. I had to learn to find my voice because I wasn't allowed to speak up. And it happened because I got sick and tired. 
I got sick and tired of being the wallflower that if I was brought to a party where the only person I knew was a person who brought me, I couldn't talk to people unless they talked to me. My palms were sweaty. My mouth was dry. I was shaking. My stomach was in a knot. Absolute social anxiety. Why? Secluded in my room for years. Years. I was grounded from grade four until grade seven, maybe grade eight too. I can't, I think grade eight too. Years. I joined the volleyball team. I'm not a morning person. We, I had to get up at six o'clock in the morning to go to volleyball practice. And I said, I'll get up at six o'clock in the morning because I need to see people. I need to do something other than just go to school and come home. And so I put myself in volleyball practice. My mom was suspicious when I did that in grade six. Mom, I want to join volleyball team. Are you just saying that because you want to get out of the house more? No, mom, I love volleyball. I completely want to be part of this team. Do you know what one of the girls said to me on the team? Why don't you just quit? Because I was so bad at it, but I just needed to get out and do something. So I had to be proactive. There's moments in my life where I had to be proactive. So I leave home. I'm, I've got a roommate. We agreed no boys are going to join us in this apartment, this two-bedroom apartment, just the two of us. She meets a boy, starts dating him. What does she do? He basically moves in. And then they come to me for permission. Can he move in? I'm like, no, this is not what we agreed on. He slaps me in the face. I moved out shortly after that. But those moments where you don't stand up for yourself, yeah. being wallflower at parties over and over again, wishing people would talk to me, being assaulted by somebody, wishing I did something about it instead of mm. seething, yeah. seething. That moment, that slap in that face was that kick in the ass that I needed. Because the way my stomach would twist when I thought about that, the way I would make a guttural sound mm. because of the fucking regret that I had that I didn't do something about that yeah. was my power to stand up for myself going forward, to have the courage to do it because that's what I lacked was courage. Yeah. So not only did I had to teach myself to not be socially awkward, I had to teach myself to be courageous enough to stand up for myself. And it was the regret that fueled my fire. Just like when you break up with somebody and you need to get over them, you need to fuel your fire. So anger is the emotion that'll fuel your fire. There's emotions that we sometimes say are bad emotions, but they're so functional in the right time and place. Mm. Anger in a relationship with your partner, when they just did a simple thing is not functional. But anger when you need to leave somebody toxic is very functional. Yeah. So you take those emotions and you use them in functional ways. So my regret was something that I used to fuel my voice. So the next time I needed to stand up for myself, even though it took so much courage because my mouth was dry, my hands were shaking, my stomach was in knots, my heart was pounding, my, it's just my whole body went into this anxiety response at the thought of standing up for myself, speaking my truth, having my boundaries and backing them up. The first few times I would say five times so scary but you get used to it with practice so now you see who I created today right mm. on these live streams you cannot walk all over me you will not walk all over me because I don't give you the ability to do so because my boundaries and my standards are strong and my voice is powerful it is <laughs> so we build ourselves right? Something that I say often is design. I take control of my environment. My environment is my design. Who is in my environment is my design. And I've designed it using standards and boundaries. My life is by design. My satisfaction, my happiness is by design. Because when we become conscious of what's happening in our environment, and we decide that we're going to control who is in our environment, we really begin to design our mental health and emotional well-being. So this is what, like, apart from the dating coaching, is this other stuff that you do with your clients? I'm a life coach. Yeah, okay. Niche in dating and relationships. Mm -hmm. And I've been coaching people since I've just, like, for over 25 years, people have been coming to me for this. Mm -hmm. It's like, when people say, what, what does it take to be a coach? I say, experience. Because, listen, <clears throat> there's so many people who went to school who got a piece of paper, hung it on the wall behind them, said, come and pay me money. Because, look, I passed tests. 
but I don't have the experience. And I don't think that's right. I, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I think about the therapy that I went to and I think about all the times I walked out of there after an hour going, I don't feel any different. I don't feel like yeah. anything's accomplished. And yeah. then when I was in university to go get my, my, my degree to become a therapist, and I was talking to my first husband, next wife, who is a child psychologist who had was finishing her PhD when he met her and became a child psychologist in the time that I knew her and having conversations, at, you know, about that journey. There's a few things she said that really made me open my eyes about her PhD. She said, if I had to do it again, I wouldn't. If I had to do it again, I wouldn't do all this, right? I wouldn't do all this. <laughs> it wasn't what she thought it was going to be. And then when it came to her training, she said, oh, no, the training is you're not supposed to tell people what to do. Because Carly, if you pay attention to what I'm doing on my live streams and you see when I kind of lean into somebody and I get the details and I start giving them advice and steps, I'm telling them what to do, aren't I? Yeah. Because that's what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm using my story as an example, aren't I? Because that's what I want to do. So when I found out that what I wanted to do wasn't what therapists were trained to do, which is use themselves as an example. They're told, do not share your story. You're not supposed to. Do not tell people what to do. It's more powerful when they figure it out on their own. Does that illuminate why the therapists you went to, some of them were pretty useless? because they didn't have the experience, but they were told not to tell you that. Yeah. And they didn't tell you what to do because they don't understand the nuances of the journey you're trying to fix because they don't have the experience. Yeah, I was horribly disappointed with therapy. Yeah. Angry, I came out angry. <laughs> yeah, because it can take like a waste of time and money because, and this is what I said to her. I said, but people go because they need instruction. Yeah, I went because I wanted someone to tell me what to fucking do. That's what I was there for. But you, the client, are not informed that their training is to not tell you what to do. Yeah. Doesn't is, Does that make sense at all? No. <laughs> makes sense to me. What makes, because that's why I went to therapy. I'm lost. And yeah. apparently you're the guide that I need so I'm gonna show up and then I walk out going I didn't I don't feel guided and I didn't know why I didn't feel guided until I started practicing and I started guiding people and people were coming back in short form like in a short amount of time and saying hey I followed your advice my darling so you've been watching me since two two three months uh, roughly yeah <laughs> did you get any of my books I did. I got your No More Assholes book. Did you read it? I did. And I read your other one. You, were, you had a free one. It was After the first kiss. No. It was the free one? You have a free book about recognising the different uh, people. Fake love need not apply. Yeah, that one. I read that. I just thought it was like an e-book. I had a look at that. And I bought the No More Assholes book, yeah. What it is was it? Was there something you learned that you're like, oh my God, I never thought about this before? Probably, but I read it a while ago now. But um, let me think. <laughs> well, do you know what? The... So, because I'm a dating coach as well. I've always agreed with the whole abstaining from the sex. But you're, when you said about the kissing, when I heard that, I was like, oh, my God. Yes. I heard you saying, like, kissing, kissing is a sexual act. And I was like, it fucking is. Yes. It's the thing that starts all the other things. I hadn't thought of that before, right? And you are, as soon as you kiss someone, you, you, it, something happens, right? Especially, well, it depends on maybe your attachment and stuff. But I know for me, yeah, it, kissing was the start of the problem. Yeah. And I never thought of that. I just thought about the sex. I was like, right, no more quick sex, blah, blah, blah. But the kissing, it's, that's a no-brainer. But it, yeah. well, it's not. <laughs> it is when you hear it, if you're ready to hear it. But it's so normalized that we just kiss people and we have to think about who normalized it right because hmm. if, if you want to if you sort of want to tear through that dysfunction that is creating so many distressing relationships tear through the dysfunction that has so many people women mostly in abusive relationships 
if you're going to rip it apart, let's start with where this came from. Why do we even think this in the first place? Because it lacks any logic whatsoever. So how did we get here to kissing somebody to pick them for a long-term relationship? We're not talking about hookups. Body mm. count doesn't matter. Having mm. fun is fine. Saying to yourself, I just want some fun and then that's it done with that person. I don't want anything more than one or two nights of fun with them. There's nothing wrong with that. We're talking about picking somebody for a long-term relationship. Who told us that the way to pick a long-term partner was to kiss and then find out who they are? Where did this come from? Do you think that came from women? Of course not. Because we don't have a 24-7 fertility cycle. So we're not that aggressive when it comes to physicality. We're not so pushy when it comes to physicality. Who gets physically touched in a sexual way unwantedly more often? Is it males touching females or females touching males? It's yeah, males it's, touching females. Yeah, so yeah. who is most, who between males and females, who is more physically aggressive when it comes to trying to acquire sexuality it's wow. males yeah. and when it comes to people talking to people about getting someone fast when i say pickup artist are they males or are they females right pickup artists are males hmm. right how many female pickup artists are there <laughs> i don't know are they <laughs> Can't even because women, there's no association. So the pickup artists are males. And what are the pickup artists telling the males? Kiss her immediately. Get that kiss in first night. As mm -hmm. soon as you can get the kiss in, get a couple drinks in her and then just lean in and get the kiss on her. And why do they say that? Because they know if they get a kiss on us, they'll quickly get more from us, mm -hmm. including our exclusivity. Yeah, this is, so yeah, this is where when you say stuff, it makes me think. So, I mean, I have got hundreds, sadly, of stories of being, like, I consider myself to be so vulnerable, but didn't really realise it. I grew up very before my time, so I was very sexual from a very young age, and I thought I knew it all. But when I realise now how vulnerable I was and how many men, and I'm talking when I was 14 or 15, I mean, I was a singer, I used to go to recording studios and stuff where, you know, that's full of predators, right? I had like 27 year old men who were managers who would take me out places. And some of them got physical, not sexually, but kissy with me. And I felt like I couldn't say no, right? Because they were dangling this kind of singing carrot. Yeah. So when I think back to that, I mean, it's one thing that I was even allowed to go out at that age, but that's disgusting, right? And I know hundreds of people that have in some way, shape or form, like taken a bunch of me or somebody else in that very small, simple way. Like even my kid's dad, when I met him, I kind of just started to become somewhat self-aware then. So I was trying to slow things down, but he was very, oh, oh, I know your work. I get, I can see you. He really was chatting, like talking me into breaking my, attempt at boundaries I mean I wasn't very good at it but I was trying at that point and he was very persuasive and using that like you know I can see your worth other people can't but I you know what I mean and it was, yeah. when I look back I'm like oh my god I would never if I'd known you like love my kids and everything glad I had them yeah. but if I'd known you then he wouldn't have had a single chance because he wasn't he didn't respect my boundaries or, yeah. you know, my well-being, as you say. Didn't respect any of that. It was all about trying to get physical. And at that point, I, once we had been like that, we ended up in this instant relationship, you know, the way you say it, it was instant, instant, um, what's the word, exclusivity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so they want your instant exclusivity so that they don't have to go source out another vajayjay. <laughs> in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. It's about acquiring. And as soon as they acquire you, it's like, whoo, I can relax. I can relax because I got her. Yeah. Have, because the 24 7 fertility cycle, right? They're driven to mm. go find the vajayjay. It's a procreation drive. I don't demonize it. Okay. I just say 
you need to protect yourself. So the sun is going to give you a sunburn. Wear the sunscreen. As much as we enjoy the sun, we need to protect ourselves against what would damage us. As much as I enjoy walking through the forest, I need to protect myself against the mosquitoes that would mm. to damage me. So these guys are out there and we just need to protect ourselves against them. We need exactly to- Exactly right. They can do what they want. People can be who they be. We yeah. have to get smart. Yes. Mm. I can't change the world, but I can change who I select. Yes. Yeah. Carly, do you have any questions for me before we wrap up today? To be honest, I don't have any specific questions. I, I'm good. We had a good chat there. <laughs> I I yeah, this is fun. I love having conversations with people who are like, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Because this is the revolution, right? Yeah. The yeah. evolution, revolution. We are evolving dating. We are evolving who we're choosing in order to mm. evolve the health of the relationships we're in order to evolve what children are witnessing in order mm. to evolve what they themselves would choose for themselves because monkey see monkey do. The mm. evolution, revolution, getting better at dating, better at relationshiping in order to help the next generation do better for themselves. Here's a question. Yeah. How would I talk about this whole no kissing thing without just sounding like I'm trying to rip you off or... Because I kind of wanted to say it, but then I've been like, oh, I don't want to sound like I'm just trying to copy you or pretend that I'm there. Right. I, listen, my purpose and goal is yeah. change. Yeah. So I want you to talk about this. I want you to teach it. If you want to do it in a way that supports me, then push my book. Mm. Push mm. the instruction manual because that's what this is. It's, I mean, it's, I know it's backwards for you guys, but it's forward. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So this is the instruction manual. So what I would encourage you do is say, I want you to have the best outcome for yourself. I, as your coach, will guide you through this. This is the book for you to read, for you to understand the nuances, the step-by-step -step nuances of it. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do for me as you teach this is use my book as a manual that you will guide them towards as you coach them in this, as they lean on you for support, getting them to buy the book would be amazing. Okay, cool. <laughs> Great. Well, it's been good talking to you. You Let's too, you. <laughs> I appreciate this. You're welcome. Bye, my love. Bye-bye. <laughs>